Coming up on Twiet, T-Mobile gets transparent, IBM shines light into the future, and software-defined networks take over the world. Twiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for this week in enterprise tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twiet. This week in enterprise tech. Episode 24, recorded December 10, 2012, for January 7, 2013. One ring to rule them all. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why I love my cloud-based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs and Ring Central is $20 per month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial and buy one desk phone and get a second one free, up to 20 phones. Call 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. Welcome to Twiet This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balasair, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And as always, I am joined by a stellar all-star cast, starting with the ever-present Mr. Brian Chi of ThinLinks. Brian, the geek in paradise there in Hawaii, how are things in, uh, well, the Pacific? Ah, uh, meh. <laughs> okay. My air conditioner died. <laughs> that's, that's true. It is paradise until you're trying to run a lab full of equipment and it's 102 degrees and 105% humidity. So we'll leave you there. You know, somewhere where it's not so humid, I actually just got back from his part of the country, Mr. Oliver Rist uh, over at InfoWorld. Oliver, thank you for joining us again. Uh, what's going on uh, in the great Northwest? Well, let's see. For the last three weeks, we've had uh, very, a varying weather pattern of uh, rain, rain, some more rain, and then some rain. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully we can get you a a variable on that theme. Now, we do have a guest for the first time on Twilight since we've moved to the Skydesk. We have a guest in studio. That's Mr. Dan Backman. Dan, thank you very much for coming on. Now, uh, I know that you were a longtime employee of Juniper. You were one of the, the brilliant lights that they had down there. You moved to a startup. Are you even allowed to tell us what their name is and what they do? I can, actually. We're officially uh, no longer stealth mode. I work for a company called Plexi. And Plexi is an SDN company, so I'm actually uh, really excited to uh, delve into the world of SDN and talk a little bit about it. I've actually been involved with a lot of that at Juniper as well, so uh, certainly have lots of interesting uh, things to share. Well, we'll be getting to the SDN front. As you can see, our, our cast is set. But first, let's jump into an Enterprise Byte, starting with one that uh, I, I kind of like. I, I, I won't lie here. T-Mobile has dropped their subsidized pricing. Now, for those of you who haven't been following all the shenanigans of the mobile carriers, the subsidized pricing was that two-year contract that you bought into that gave you a cheap phone, maybe a, a $100 or $200 smartphone, and then you're locked in for two years. And if you cancel at any time, there's a crazy high early termination fee. Well, T-Mobile has decided that, no, that's that's not what people want. That's not what our customers want. They want to have an upfront pricing of how much the phone costs. They could still pay in installments, but uh, we want to let them know this is what your phone costs and this is what your service costs. Uh, Chibert, I want to start with you. Uh, do, do you like this? Is this a good move? Is this something that other carriers are going to be following? You know, I don't know. You know, on one hand, I like the cheap phones, but on the other hand, if T-Mobile can drop my monthly cost, that would be pretty awesome too, because I've got five phones on it and it's getting expensive. Right, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I actually do use T-Mobile's value pricing right now. I have a smartphone that I, I bought at full price. I, actually, I'm lying there. I got it at Google I.O. It's a, a Galaxy Nexus, which was unlocked. And uh, I can use a $30 a month T-Mobile prepay plan, pre plan, which means I've got no contract, no termination fee. It works incredibly well for me. Now, they want to use their value pricing, which could still lock you into a contract for uh, well, a decent service. For example, they have a two-year contract that gives you unlimited everything, voice, text, data, for $50 a month. 
Oliver, I, I got to ask you, what is, is, is this going to affect what enterprise customers do? Because I know a lot of enterprises, a lot of small businesses have been using subsidized pricing to spread out the cost of their telecom over a, a period of time. If T-Mobile is now offering this transparent pricing, is, is that something that's, that's easier for an enterprise to do or something that's more difficult? Uh, probably more difficult because an uh, enterprise will never accept a, uh, a straight pricing scheme like like that. Small business, I think, would love it, but uh, an, an enterprise is going to want a volume license deal or a volume uh, subscription service, something like that. And if, if T-Mobile is backing away from that, um, I don't see enterprises being all that happy with it. I think one of the wild cards, and I want to throw this to you, Dan, is I, I could see a possible move in leasing. Right now, for example, this is the reason why Windows PCs are still bread and butter in the enterprise. Uh, the reason why they're so popular is you can get a volume lease. You can say, I'm going to lease a thousand PCs. It's going to cost me this much. It's, it's basically market price. If you could start doing the same thing with smartphones, you start bundling in the smartphones and then getting the better pricing on service, that's one way I think this scheme could work its way into the enterprise. Uh, Dan, I mean, you deal a lot with, um, with end users. Do you, do you think this is something that could become popular in the enterprise, or is this sort of dead, dead on arrival really only for consumers? Well, it depends on what the whole value prop is. I mean, we're seeing more and more large enterprises actually do a lot of bring their own device. So um, at this point, the question is always, is always why, as an enterprise, would you even subsidize the phones? Why do, if people are going to bring their own phones anyway, uh, it's something that uh, I've seen at the last couple companies I've been with. Um, it's it's kind of an interesting uh, it's an interesting challenge, and it actually makes a lot of sense for the carriers to do this because it allows people to basically choose exactly what device they want and not have to make a new carrier decision every time they want to upgrade their device and extend their contract. Uh, actually, I, I really like that. Uh, if if the uh, end user is already going to be bringing their own device, their own tablet, of course they're also going to bring their own phone. And if enterprise could say, fine, you bring your device and we'll bring you your service, yeah, that is a value proposition. Not bad. I want to go on to the next story. This one comes to us thanks to David Eckert for tweeting me this story last night. I, I thought it was fascinating. I thought we had to bring it up in an enterprise bite. And that is IBM has developed a new light-based chip. We've talked about this sort of technology for a while, that light was the next step. Looks like IBM has actually made that step in an important way in that it can be mass-produced and it can be mass-produced inexpensively. So it's rumored to be less expensive than other potential light-based tech. It's also rumored that, that the chip would have a vari variable number of channels, each of which could sustain transfers of up to 25 gigabits per second. Now, the cool thing about this is we use light in the data center already. I mean, most of our long-distance runs are going to be fiber. But what this would allow us to do is to take the, uh, the electronic impulse to light transceiver from the end of a bus and to actually move it into the chip, which means, if you take this to its logical conclusion, you could create a processor that's as big as your network. As many nodes as you have, you have full speed access to all the different parts of a processor's most vital pieces. Chiebert, what do you think about this? I mean, this, this is one of these things that this could be a game changer. If, if suddenly my data center becomes one big processor, what kind of effect is that going to have on efficiencies? Well, one, you know, we're already starting to use large scale clusters. You know, Google's using it, um, Facebook's using it, and so forth. The concept of being able to have, being able to throw lots and lots of processing at a problem and very quickly and, you know, doesn't cost a ton of money is a big thing. Uh, one thing that the article did miss is the fact that about five years ago, IBM started um bringing out from behind the curtain a new holographic memory um storage device they are estimating that if it could ever be brought to market you know reasonably we're talking about a petabyte in the size of a sugar cube and if you directly connect optical connections to um processors we're going to have some really interesting things maybe how how might start showing up over your shoulder uh Oliver Chiebert brings up an interesting point, and that is that this has been a pie-in-the-sky thing for a while. We've heard about it for the last decade. IBM swears this time that they have a process that works, that can be mass-produced, mass and can be mass-produced relatively inexpensively. Do you think this is making the transition from vaporware into something that, you know, within 10 years, it might be commonplace? Uh, having written a story on the, uh, the holographic uh, 
storage technology, what, eight years ago and getting fried because they never actually showed up with it, um, I'm going to have to say I'll wait till I see it. Nice. I like that. I like that. Once bitten, twice shy. So yeah. we're talking about nanophotonic technology. Dan, this, promo, this gives us all sorts of interesting uh, possibilities within the data center. If I'm now right, routing impulses from the CPU itself and the processor itself, rather than routing packets, uh, what would this do at uh, well, a company like yours, which is supposed to do software design networking? Uh, now you could have software design processing. So in the data center, um, the interesting thing to start looking at is it's not just the processing. I mean, the question here is, are they intending to use this actually for logic inside the CPU or is it just a communications channel? Uh, right now, one of the biggest challenges is in the data center, we've already taken the idea of CPU and memory and made that as a relatively fungible resource across the data center. And one of the things driving SDN largely is the fact that you actually need a tremendous amount of communication between these systems and it has to be very high speed and very flexible. So the first question I would ask is, uh, how cheap is this going to be? Uh, ultimately, what you'll need is, what effectively, what the data center is evolving to is a very, very large communications fabric of one type or another, and you're seeing the industry splinter out in, into lots of different ways of solving this, tech, of, of solving the problem, rather. Using optical technology is actually particularly interesting. It's actually one of the things that uh, is one of the key value propositions for what my company does, is that uh, it does use optical switching. And one of the things you get out of optical switching is it allows you to actually create direct paths from one place to another. This reduces the latency. So as you start distributing processing and as you start separating the processing from the data and even the memory sometimes, you need to reduce the communications latency between all these resources. So if they get this right, it's, it's going to be relatively complex to manage, I think, in terms of all the large number of paths, but it allows you to really reduce the latency of communication inside the data center and make it really work much better together. Yeah. And again, as a geek, I'm really excited by the potential for this kind of technology. I, mean, I know that it could turn the tech industry on its on its head. As Oliver stated, we all heard about possible holographic storage. We know that light is the next step, but uh, as, as Brian stated, you know, I kind of want to see if this is, is going to shake out before I, I invest. Well, that's the end of our Enterprise Bytes, but, uh, you know, I think perhaps we need to have a word. I'm, I'm, I'm from, from just a distinguished gentleman. Let me break the time-space barrier here really quickly and find out what he has to say. You know, when we built the Twit Studio, we wanted to do as much as possible in the cloud. Our documents are handled in the cloud. Our email is in the cloud. Our scheduling is done all in the cloud. Well, because we want to eat our own dog food. We want to practice what we preach. This internet revolution is real. And that's why when we started looking at a phone system, we looked at Ring Central. Our tech guy, Russell, said, look, there's a phone system that operates entirely in the cloud. That means no bulky PBX system in the basement. That means no difficult installation of additional cables. Basically, if you're wired for the Internet, you're wired for your phone with Ring Central. It's a true cloud-based phone system. Zero startup costs, no PBX hardware to install or maintain. Ring Central allows us to customize all of our call handling. Our producers get their voicemail and their email. We get our fax messages right on our smartphones, and we get an easy-to-use interface that lets us customize how we get our communications. RingCentral offers all-inclusive pricing, as low as $20 per month per user. You can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial, and they have a special offer for my listeners. When you buy one desk phone, you get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. So call this number, designated for my listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980. Again, 800-543-9980. Or you can go to ringcentral.com and use the promo code TWIT. We thank Ring Central for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, thank you very much, Father Robert. Uh, I, I'd like to take time out now to, um, well, hear stuff my IT guy says. Hi, I'm Brian Chi, and I'm co-host of TWIT, This Week in Enterprise Technology on the TWIT TV network. I'm here at the Inter Interop Knock in, in New York City. Today I'm talking with Mike Bannock of HP, and we're going to be talking about software-defined networks. And, you know, Mike, 
what is software defined networks and you know let, let's let's dive a little bit into that sure so Brian I'll give you a, a definition that we helped co-create with the Open Networking Foundation uh, since we are a founding member we published a white paper with out of the ONF and there's a, a very clear definition in there that in the software defined networking architecture you separate the control from the data plane and that you maintain state not just for a networking device but for the entire network centrally and that allows you to then decouple applications from the network infrastructure now the, some of this may sound Sound familiar to what people have seen because we have decoupled control and data forwarding planes in individual devices but this is a more advanced level of abstraction today while you can have that separation for one device mm -hmm. people don't want to have programmability for 24 port switches uh, maybe a hundred of them they they want to they want to have programmability for a single 2400 port switch and that's going to give them a level of uh, simplicity and scale and then automation on top of that right and how, we're starting to start we're starting to hear things about the movement of the open stack open flow arena how does software defined networking tie into open stack so there's um, in the software defined networking architecture there's this notion of open programmable interfaces at the control plane both southward as well as northbound sure. and the open programmable interfaces that are northbound allow that control plane to plug into things like OpenStack and Quantum so that you can have this single uh, point of orchestration not just for compute and storage but also network so you can build a set of self-service interfaces for for uh, services that then automate the configuration and the services associated with all of the IT stacks, not mm -hmm. just single functions. So basically, it sounds like we are going to be able to more rapidly um, respond to changes in the industry. If someone comes up with the latest and greatest protocol, because of the decoupling, we're going to be able to, say, do some development without having to re-architect the entire switch network. Well, you're definitely right about speed because in a cloud environment, you want agility. And that's what software-defined networking is really going to deliver that we haven't had before. Today, if somebody wants to deploy a new application, usually the best time you can achieve in network provisioning is measured in weeks, usually a couple of weeks. And what people really want is a handful of minutes. And instead of having people programming the network, they want to make that completely automated through self-service so that way it's instantaneous and you don't need the, the network admin isn't necessarily in the middle. Network admin is going to do a lot of things, but actual hands-on programming might not necessarily be one of them. So just like with cloud, you need agility. That's what Software Defined Network delivers. So by having this so-called new way of having a green field of being able to develop new and faster and so forth. What kind of changes do you see happening in the industry being driven by this movement? So the, there's a well there's a lot of changes. One of the ones that gets talked about a lot is around uh, automating the virtualization of the data center network and that's where a lot of the SDN conversation has been. So there's been uh, applications from HP as well as others around how do you create that network virtualization that's essentially an overlay mm -hmm. on the physical data center network. And one of the things that we believe is important is that you have to have a the, the physical and the virtual coupled together because as you automate the change at the virtual layer you have to be able to have that reach down and touch the physical and be able to have the automation go all the way through um, all of the layers of the network so you know one person was saying SDN sounds a lot to me like the kind of automation we wanted from network management and there is some truth to that but automation and network management we have to remember is around things like FCAPs and one of those things is network configuration OpenFlow provides for great things like how do you automate the packet uh, handling instructions you want a switch or a router to implement, but it doesn't do things like set the IP address and the net subnet mask and the ACLs. Network management automating network config provides that. So marrying those two things together is going to be pretty important, and that's going to be game-changing for the industry. It's not going to be incremental evolution. It'll be somewhat disruptive to people, and that's going to be an important thing to consider is the people change, not just the technology yeah. change. Well, and with these kind of changes, what we're going to start having is the new world the new networking. Anyway, thank you very much, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Brian, thank you. And this has been Brian Chi, and this has been Stuff My IT Guy Says. This would usually be the time where we uh, well, we'd kick it around a little bit and find out exactly what was said in Stuff My IT Guy Says, but we don't have to do that anymore because we have an avowed expert 
in SDN, Mr. Dan Backman. Uh, now, we heard very early on in that video that we're going to be separating the data plane from the control plane, from the management plane. Exactly what does that mean? I mean, if, if I'm just a, a geek at home wondering how SDN is going to change the way I design networks for my small business and, and eventually for a data center, what does that terminology mean in real world terminologies? So it's easy to get lost in the term. If you talk to networking vendors about control plane and data plane, they'll tell you they've separated that a long time. Uh, and what that really means is that there's kind of two things any network device does, one of which is forward packets. You'd imagine that's kind of job number one. And then the other one of which is the control process, things that run things like routing protocols, switching protocols. And traditionally, those are always separated in some form or another so that you can forward packets as fast as you want and you can still update changes. Uh, back when the routers originally had one CPU doing everything, there's this interesting problem you had to solve, which is, what do you do first? Do you forward a packet, or do you figure out an update to figure out where to send it next? So if you don't have that data up to date, then you could be sending packets to the wrong place. So the whole idea of uh, separating control plane and forwarding was the fact that you can kind of make those happen orthogonally. What SDN is really talking about is actually pulling it potentially outside of the box. So networks today work through distributed calculations. They're all kind of made to be relatively independent. You give them a configuration, and the configuration tells them what to do. It tells them how to behave. You give it rules on, if something happens effectively, what do I do? And that's what the configuration is. And the routers or switches will talk to each other and assemble a topology and kind of figure out what the network should look like and how to move packets. The main idea of SDN is starting to look at, well, what happens if you want to make it a little more dynamic, if you want to give feedback into the network and have it do things dynamically based on the conditions running inside the network. So it's the idea of actually taking some of the control plane, which normally runs inside the device, and creating sort of a, a little tap in there for the brain of that device so you can, uh, you can give it very dynamic directions. Okay. So, in other words, by separating the control path from the data path, what I'm, I'm really doing is I'm allowing each of those to be done as efficiently as possible. If I no longer have the same box trying to, to figure out and update its its routes and at the same time forward all the packets, but, but rather I have one system that's acting as traffic cop and one system that's acting as pure brute force router, I, I let each piece of hardware do what it does best. Absolutely. And that was, that was kind of a big deal about 10 years ago. Um, as you as as routers started to move into sort of hardware based routers that was a big architecture that most of the vendors came forward with sdn is really kind of past that it's basically saying instead of just giving it a set of directions on how to behave what happens when you want to be able to change those directions dynamically based on the conditions of the network? And that's traditionally been very hard because that actually requires today, in many cases, somebody actually going into the router CLI and starting to type to actually give it new configuration. It's just too slow. So this is actually one of the larger promises of SDN is really this communications path into the network devices. Uh, you'll always have some level of separation between control plane and data plane, but this is more about opening up that communications path. Chibert, I want to throw this over to you a bit because we both had a chance to play with HP's SDN solutions. And one of the ways that they're using this is to turn a, a, a rack of switches into a virtually huge switch. So, for example, uh, I, I believe it was mentioned in the video that rather than having 124 port switches, you could have one 2400 port switch and that's done because you've separated the control path from the data path because you can have an, a, a UI that basically looks at all your ports as part of one big piece of infrastructure. Looking at the data center and the, the projects that you've done in the academic side, when would something like that become really useful? I mean, consolidating switches across the world, across campuses, or even across buildings? Dude, it's already useful. Um, just think stacking, you know, how many people stack switches? Dan and I actually first met when he was at Extreme Networks and uh, starting to play with big honking switches called Black Diamonds. You know, the data center has wanted port density for a long time, but it's been a royal pain in the behind to manage. Uh, if you can manage it across an enterprise, suddenly some really interesting things start happening, especially when you start talking about uh, integrating in things like IDS and IPS and so forth, um, being able to implement things like network access control, having this kind of interesting. 
Okay, Chibert's gone into the Max Headroom loop. Uh, we'll get back with him in just a second. Now, uh, Oliver, I want to break this over to you because you've been covering a parallel story. Uh, but Bannock mentioned that uh, we have software-defined networking. We also have software-defined services. We have virtual services. How do you see these coming together as we can, in software, define both the network and the services that run over that network? So uh, yeah, when you you were you were saying I bumped into it, uh, I bumped into it at an OpenStack conference, which was my first exposure to OpenStack. Uh, uh, had a lot of conversations with guys building that that technology. Um, it, it reminded me a lot of the early days of Linux, where a new technology came out. Um, mostly it was vapor. Uh, it was it was not you know in its very early stages, and everyone was very excited about the possibilities. Um, you two, Brian and Chibert, you're what we call super geeks. Um, what I was worried about when I talked to these guys is I asked for the average IT pro, how do they stay relevant when this happens, right? Because the physical network is going to be pushed down basically flat and everything's going to happen at a, at a software layer. Uh, and the answer I got over and over and over again was IT guys are going to have to learn how to dev, period, right? It's going to be IT dev. That's going to be the, the, the sexy role. That's not hard for you two, or maybe it's less hard. But for the average guy, say like me, um, who's a you know a bright lights and switches guy, sitting down and learning programming is not on my list of uh, to do things. So uh, it's it's a little scary for the average IT pro if this is if this is the uh, trend. And I don't think the tools right now are are everyday man tools. I think they're they're very sophisticated at the moment. You can correct me. I obviously haven't haven't used it yet, but um, it's kind of putting a scare in a lot of people. Now, we're continuing our discussion about SDN. I want to give it back to you, Dan. Uh, let's take some just regular steps. Let's say I have something like uh, down below there, we have a, a Netgear 10 gig switch. It actually does support OpenFlow. I, I, I've got an engineer who wants to start playing with software-defined networking. What would be the steps he would have to take in order to take that switch and, and make it SDN usable? That's an interesting question. So if you hear about SDN, the thing you hear more about than anything is something called OpenFlow. Uh, let's first disambiguate what we're talking about. SDN sounds a lot like a technology. So if you're a technologist running a network, the first thing you want to dive into is understand what is this SDN thing that everybody's trying to build. SDN is actually not a technology. It's an approach to solving a problem. And you'll find that there's this huge pantheon of technologies that people are developing to try to solve that problem. OpenFlow is one of them. One of the big goals that you see out of SDN is the idea of making the network more dynamic and programmable. So think of OpenFlow effectively as assembler for network programmability. OpenFlow, it's something that you should never have to know or worry about. Uh, ultimately, you'll have some application that speaks to your switches using OpenFlow. So I'd actually start with that. Start looking at what are the applications you're going to run and how are those going to talk to your devices. Okay. Well, let, let's get uh, real practical here. And that is... I know I can run SDN. I can run OpenFlow in some of the switches I already have in my stack. Uh, I know there are certain advantages, but flesh out those advantages for me. What does an, a software-defined network allow me to do that I cannot currently do or I cannot do easily with a traditional network? So that's the operative question. Uh, as we talk about SDN, the first question you have to ask is, why is it popping up now? And have you noticed where it's popping up? Almost every SDN discussion you see is centered around the data center. So the data center, if you ask yourself, why is this the hotbed of SDN, it really comes down to a simple thing. This is the first time we're asking the network to behave differently than it's used to behaving. So think of how you build a network. If you look traditionally how you build a data center, what you've really built is a small campus network, which is collapsed together. You see your standard three-tier design. Well, one of the challenges now is as soon as you have VMs moving around the data center and connecting to storage and virtual resources all over the place, the network has always been based on the idea that things don't move. So the tough thing for networks to deal with right now is the fact that you now have mobile endpoints, which are your VMs moving from one place to the other. So you have to have policy in the network, which actually attaches to that. Think of it like the VLAN configuration, maybe ACLs that you've provisioned on the port, even things like policy-based routing. The challenge is if you're manually configuring this and now you have things moving around all the time, that's a challenge. 
So that's actually where SDN is coming from. It's, it's saying, how do we make the networks more dynamic? Today, they're very static. That's generally how a lot of network architecture is built. So SDN is about making the configuration and the behavior of these networks very dynamic. Uh, that's interesting. For example, when we were doing uh, uh, network administration at Interop, oftentimes what you would do is you would isolate a box or you would isolate a client that either needed certain services or that needed to be blocked from certain mm -hmm. attacks. But the way that you would do that is you would find the switch and the port on which it resides, and then you would set rules for that switch or that port. If it moved, you had to do it again. So SDN would allow me to set policy for, uh, say, and I can say, look, if you see an iPad, no matter on what port you see, no matter on what switch it is, no matter what part of the network, I would like you to undertake these types of actions. And the switch themselves don't need to be aware of that policy. It's only the traffic cop that actually has to know what's, what's supposed to happen. That's effectively what it's trying to do, exactly. And then the other piece to this is the whole software-defined portion of it basically says if the if the challenge is actually having something somebody interact with the device itself, how do you actually tell the network how to behave? There's an interesting thing in networking that's, that's grown up for a long time. You can think of the world of applications that run on top of the network, and you can think of the network itself, and there's kind of this really big wall between them. The network is always set up to behave the way it wants to behave and the policies you want it to behave with, and then the applications are set up to run on top of the network as if it was a big cloud. So they've never really been able to talk to each other. So you've never had the capability of having your application ask the network, hey, do I have enough bandwidth to move this large data transfer? So you can actually start to think of SDN as what happens if we poke a little hole through this wall and we give a way for applications in the network to communicate with each other. So as we talk about SDN, some of it is how do we, how do we actually program the behavior of the network devices themselves? That's where things like OpenFlow play in. That, think of that as a southbound communication where you have some idea of something that you talk to, a controller, if you will, and how it tells the network how to behave. That's one part of SDN. Almost the more interesting part, though, is how do you talk to that thing that controls the network? What's this northbound API, as we call it? Something that allow your applications to talk to the network as a whole. And Chibert actually mentioned this idea of how do you treat the network as one logical entity? How do you abstract it? We tend to think of it as lots of switches or routers. How do we make it behave like one thing that you can control? And that's a lot of what SDN is driving towards. Chibert, let me throw this to you. What exactly do we get out of thinking of our network as one huge entity? I mean, uh, yes, I, I see there are benefits from being able to, <coughs> to set policy on particular clients or particular endpoints and have it have that policy follow them around the network. But what what would be the the bigger, let's say, data center administrator advantages of having a million port switch uh, uh, that's based around the world? Actually, it's not so much in my mind. It's not so much the giant switch or one giant switch or you know something like that it's more along the lines of for god's sakes it, it's great to have one standard you know one thing that i can go and manage you know it's the one ring to rule them all type of thing i want to be able to have you know brand x y and z and i want them to play nicely and i want to be able to go and implement policies just ask anyone that's running a big um shop for you know brand x you know big brand x and ask them to implement quas policy across their enterprise uh quas tends to be a black box you know black magic and it's a royal pain to implement with something like openflow and software defined networks suddenly we're now thinking brand x y and z as a single entity rather than three entities Oliver, I, I want to give you the, the crazy eyes futurist prediction here. <laughs> so I've got OpenStack, I've got OpenFlow. I've got two technologies that, that seem to be on the rise right now, and both of which seem to be based on making things change just as I need them to change. Software Networking on demand. Now, if I'm talking about both the, the northbound and the southbound communications here, when I can redefine the network and I can also have the software be redefined, the services be redefined, how do they interact? If I have services that can request network resources and then I have a network that can request certain behaviors out of software services, where, where does this leave us? I mean, it, it sounds like this is sort of, we're getting to that the end times of networking where the, the network takes care of itself. And how often have you heard that? <laughs> I don't mean to be the, the, the naysayer, right? But um, I heard the word program, I don't know, 15 times in the last uh, two minutes from, from you guys. The 
OpenStack, yes, it's it's on the move. So is OpenFlow. But if you ask some guy who's actually building a network right right now, those really, uh, I, I doubt you're going to see a lot of that in production right now. So, uh, and mainly, I think that's because the tool set is still really raw. Uh, as of August, the at least the SDN um, interface was the command line, right? That was you, you had to compile your your own code, which is why the uh, the OpenStack guys were were saying IT pros are going to have to learn Dev. Okay, that's what the Linux guys used to say about uh, programming your your own kernel. I don't know how far that went, but uh, I think the the most popular Linux uh, distros now don't ask you to do that, right? So. Once I see the tools coming out of OpenStack, actual production, not beta, not vapor, uh, which they, by the way, were still in August, largely vapor, um, then I'll start, you know, predicting the, the utopia of networking. I, I really appreciate that. And I, I want to kick that back to you, Dan. Uh, he brings up a good point, which is the promise is there. I mean, it sounds like a nerdtopia of networking here. But what are the challenges of implementing SDN? And, and why don't we see more enterprises actually making the move? The technology is there. It's been, it's been relatively well proven. Um, you know, we've done demonstrators on show floors before. And it sounds like this is one of those things that should have an immediate ROI if I can, immediate, if I can in real time redefine my network and my services. So why don't we see a big push to, to actually implementing this in the data center? So it has to do something pretty important, that is be useful. So SDN, there's an old curse that says, may you live in interesting times. Well, that's definitely true as we start looking at SDN right now. Think of this as the time when everybody is experimenting with different ways to solve the problem. In reality, there's nothing new about SDN. I think I, it was either Chibert or Oliver who mentioned this earlier. We've been doing this for a long time. So. Every time you type into the CLI of a switch or router, there's software that takes what you type and translates it to the behavior of whatever packet forwarding engines or ASICs are underneath there. So what we've already done is we've taken this idea of if you can do that, how about if you create, let's say, a cluster of devices, maybe a ring of devices, and you can start to have those behave as one logical device. It's still the same CLI. You've just abstracted it. So these things that used to be separate things that you had touched look like one big thing. So that's ultimately where I think this is going to go. The key here, though, is whatever happens with SDN, as a network engineer, it is potentially scary. I sort of went through my scary phase on this as well. The first thing you realize is as soon as we, as soon as these technologies start congealing a little bit more, the S and the D go away. It's just going to become networking. And you're going to have to understand how networks work and how to influence the behavior of these networks. That's not going to change. What we're just looking at is how do we start to do things that are a little bit richer than the CLI. So ultimately, as you look at implementing SDN, the end goal is how do you make the network do what you meant it to do and have some of the details get out of the way? Chibert, what about that? So I like this, having little clusters of the network that are SDN, the ones that are most suited, perhaps the ones that are being built right now. But what are the challenges of meshing together a, a software-defined network with your traditional network, where you, you, you drive a CLI and you put uh, configurations for particular ports? What are we going to see as we bring together those two technologies, and what will be the challenges of having them work play nicely with one another? Actually, uh, the analogy I can draw is actually along the lines of Active Directory versus LDAP versus Novell E Directory. Um, there are probably going to be islands for quite a while, but software defined networking, one of the things that I see is how do you handle the authentication? How do you make sure someone doesn't slide in some stray packets in there to redefine, say, a secure HR network? to the outside so that a hacker can harvest um, trusted information. That's going to be the real big scary point in my mind. So having the ability to um, very, very securely authenticate these transactions, uh, I think that's pretty going to be a lot uh, of a key issue on making sure that when we start having one big giant switch that can move things around easily, that it doesn't move something in the wrong place. Oliver, what, what do you think about that? I mean, that that is a legitimate concern. When we've got software-defined networking uh, and all of my ports could be reassigned in real time by either an administrator or by the software services that are running on the network, th there seems to be a lot of, well, a lot of opportunity for goofing here. Uh, goofing, that's a that's a nice word for, for data center hacking. Um, yes, I, I agree with that. Uh, 
having just gone through Windows Server 2012, I know those guys uh, have something in there called the Hyper-V Extensible Switch, which I believe is compatible with HP's uh, offering. That's the first and earliest sign of actual in-production SDN that I've seen. Um, and yeah, according to the, the funny thing is, their only real selling point at the moment seems to be security, right? The ability to define your own security policy uh, on, a, on a customized level. So I guess that's the that's the initial direction that at least uh, the software layer at the you know at the commercial server side is going to be taking how well it works i don't know time time will tell dan uh, let's get to some nitty gritty here i, I want to give you a chance to talk about your company's actual approach to sdn because you believe that there is there is a best practices way to implement sdn in your in your enterprise what approach do you take that uh, addresses some of these concerns and perhaps provides an easier experience for an administrator who's looking to set up SDN clusters within his network. Well, let me take that in two parts. There's two things that you really want to look at in SDN. The first one of which is start asking the question of what problem are you trying to solve? Remember, SDN is an approach. So what you'll find is lots of people are doing SDN-like things to solve different kinds of problems. So the company I work for, one of the things that uh, I think is relatively interesting about it is it's trying to solve a path problem and sort of a bandwidth allocation problem in the data center. It says that if you have a certain pool of bandwidth, how do you dynamically allocate that so that the applications that have certain needs can get that behavior automatically and then provide a connection to the application so they can actually start to request that, so you can actually start to dynamically build these topologies inside the data center. But SDN doesn't just do that. You find companies that are doing lots of things. So if, if you look at, there's sort of three different reasons why people will do an SDN solution. The first one of which is, if you look at that edge policy problem, so think of what you would configure at the edge port in a data center, one of the challenges is once you have VMs that start to move around, how do you make these policies follow them? Well. Can you pull that outside of the network and have that happen inside the vhosts themselves? You see that happening in some of the Azure environments, some of the uh, vCenter environments. Uh, VMware recently purchased a company that does exactly that, that sort of handles this edge policy problem. And they do it by creating what's called an overlay, literally tunneling across the network. One of the other reasons people are playing with SDN is how do you make these devices behave differently than they normally would? So if you have a standard Ethernet switch, you know how it's going to behave, how it's going to forward packets. But what happens if you want it to do something different? That's typically where you see OpenFlow plop in. In this case, if you have the ability to now tell it specifically, when this happens, do what I told you, not what I meant, that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. So a lot of the OpenFlow solutions are based on that. And then the last one is one that's actually trying to solve this problem of path. This is actually a really big problem. Quite, this is a really big problem in networking. I'm not sure we have enough time to go into the real details, but inside a network, it's actually very difficult to say, I want this specific traffic to go to points A, B, C, and D, and then E. It's generally designed to just move all traffic the quickest way to get to a destination. And the only place where we see technologies that actually solve that is in large carrier networks using things like MPLS with traffic engineering. So those are really the three places that we see SDN pop up. So as you're talking to different vendors that have SDN solutions, I would actually start off by saying, which problem is it that we're trying to solve? Is it policy? Is it creating new behaviors in devices? Or is it trying to solve a path and bandwidth problem? Chibert, let me throw that over to you. So we've got the three things that we're trying to solve. Which one do you think you deal with most often? Which one do you think that is the most important to deal with first? In the academic environment, my I actually have a problem where I need to have uh, VLANs pop up on multiple islands across the University of Hawaii network. Right now, asking my IT group to do that, uh, I had better make sure I deliver a crate of beer for them because they're going to be really pissed off at me uh, for asking such a thing. Uh, so I think being able to define where um, where my data pops up and so forth without having to go through MPLS pain, I think that's going to be number one on my hit list. Oliver, what about you? Uh, when we're talking about the promise of SDN, we're, when we're talking about best practices, if we really are trying to figure out first what problem we're trying to solve, what problem comes to mind as the most pressing? Well, <laughs> um, working mostly with Windows Server, I, I got to go back to security. Uh, that's, that's their biggest problem. Um, the ability to, I guess, to find my network in my own way, it, once those tools show up, that would, that would be the biggest attractor for me. All right. 
uh, uh, Dan, well, I'm sorry, you, you look like you're, you're jumping here. You, you really I am jumping because I, I actually didn't answer the security question before. Um, if you're asking the question about security, look at how you control the network today. There's already authentication built into who's allowed to tell the network what to do. And in most networks, there's usually a large change control process built around that. But look what's actually happened in the server world. What we're talking about doing in SDN is really logically not that different than what we already did with servers in either a Hyper-V environment or a VMware environment. Now you have the ability to move something from one place to the other. That's based on input. It could be somebody clicking and dragging, or it could be a programmatic thing. So I, I would say the security thing is definitely concerned. We definitely want to have a way to lock down those instructions. But fundamentally, it's not really that different from things we're already doing inside the data center. All right, Oliver, Chiebert, last chance. I want to let you, uh, at, while we've got him here, ask anything of Dan that you think we need to know about SDN that has not already been covered in the episode. Thoughts, concerns? Where's yeah, I do. Dan. Oh. Go ahead, Oliver. Uh, can Microsoft steal it? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, uh, they're already making a move toward it. So that interface is well known. Um, it's it's familiar and comfortable to to a lot of people. So if they move along quickly, can Windows Server just just take it? Probably not. What they can do is they can implement some things that achieve a certain goal. So Microsoft is already pushing, and I'll get into the really nitty gritty here. They're, uh, they're pushing something called NVGRE, at least they were last time I talked to them, which is the idea of it's a tunneling protocol that the V hosts can use to actually talk to each other and do their own VLAN provisioning. That's actually very similar to what VMware is doing with VXLAN. So what you'll find is how you do it under the covers is actually less important than how you present it to the outside world. So I think one of the other questions that I saw in the chat room is, are there standard SDN interfaces? And I think what, where you should look to that is, if you look at a Microsoft or you look at a VMware, you actually find that the value that they're giving is not primarily in the actual hypervisor, the thing that actually virtualizes the server, but it's the control system on top of that, what we call the orchestration layer. So I think as we look at things like OpenStack and sort of the networking equivalent uh, or the networking component of that quantum, what we're actually gonna be looking at is, what is the interface that this orchestration system can tell the network what to do? And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of this, uh, a lot of this technology congeal. And once you have that interface, you can actually translate that to behaviors of different systems underneath. Uh, Dan, I, I do want to give you the last word on this. And, and could it be, if we've got geeks out there who would like to know a little bit more about SDN, maybe some basic resources, where would you suggest they go? That's, uh, there's lots of resources that you can use to look at right now. Um, I would actually say spend some time with some of the different vendors. And I think what you'll find is spending more time talking to different, or to different people that are trying to solve the problem in different ways is the best way to really understand it. Uh, I would certainly encourage people to take a look at uh, Plexi's solution. Uh, that's a solution for the data center specifically for traffic engineering and for data center control. But there's lots of different approaches to this. And I, I haven't seen one place that really, uh, that really captures everything in one spot. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, okay, okay, Cheever, fine. <laughs> I gave the last word to Dan, but you want to come in. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. You need to come to Interop. Dan, are you, have you gotten the invitation for our labs yet? Is Glenn bugging you yet? I haven't heard from him yet, but I suspect he will soon. Yeah, I hope so too. Uh, Interop 1, if you're on the chat room, Hey, this is sounding like um, open flow and all this kind of good stuff for iLabs. It's heating up, but I think we need to have an iLabs this year at Interop Las Vegas. Well, I think we can make you that Twyat promise because we will be doing an episode of Twyat from the Interop show floor. Uh, if, if Dan joins us, we're going to have to do SDN part two. Can, can we call that? Absolutely. Okay, we'll call it. I'm sorry, but it seems as if you've used up another hour with the geeks of Twyat. Uh, thanks for watching, but before we go, I, I do want to say thank you to my, my panel. Again, this show is not possible without them. Let's start with you, Chibert. What's going on at, uh, at the University of Hawaii? What's going on with, uh, with your uh, virtualization work? What's going on with the multiple hats that you have as the geek in paradise? Well, other than looking like Lego man, uh, obviously I'm going to have to take a good hard look at what's happening in my upstream switches. But uh, I'm actually going to be... you. Um, reviewing for InfoWorld a uh, new fat twin from Supermicro. It's a uh, high density blade server that ought to be really interesting. And one of the things that I was poking at you is this. Um, I'm a big Kickstarter fan and my twine finally arrived yesterday, well, the other day. And 
I'm uh, playing around with that now. Okay. So Chiebert's still addicted to Kickstarter. Oliver, what about you? Uh, what new and exciting things should the Twilight audience expect from the man in the Northeast? West. The man in the Northeast. Uh, well, uh, uh, this is directly relatable to you. Um, I am finishing up a review that was sadly due today uh, on Windows Server Essentials combined with Office 365 to offer that whole small business end-to-end uh, -end solution. So if that comes out good, maybe you could get off that Google Docs sadness and, and you know move to a real platform. Oh, we like everyone here. Google Docs is, is fine, although I will not object to, to being on Office 365. Dan, our in-studio guest, uh, now that your company is out of stealth mode, do you want to tell us a little bit about what we can expect from you in the next six or so months? Absolutely. So I encourage you to go take a look at Plexi.com. We just started revealing some of what we're doing with our technology. It's actually a network hardware software play for the data center. So what you'll find is it is it is actually a series of Ethernet switches for the data center. They also have some very cool optical technology. Chibert, I'm sure you'll be uh, really curious to hear with what we're doing in terms of the uh, optical technology inside of there, as well as some really fascinating problems to the uh, path uh, engineering and basically network affinity problems. Uh, Plexi is really about helping to define affinity groups that control how different types of applications can talk to each other. Think like separating out your iSCSI communication and guaranteeing that it actually has end-to-end -end communication. So I'm really excited by what Plexi is doing, and uh, I certainly am going to be spending a lot of time not only evangelizing Plexi, but SDN in general. Well, thank you, Dan, and thanks for coming on. It's, it's always nice to have a guest in, this, in the studio. Now, uh, to you, to our loyal listener or watcher, uh, if you're do downloading this just one time, did you know that you could get it delivered to your device automatically each and every single week? That's right. You could get all the Twyad goodness at your fingertips with just a click. If you go to twit.tv slash Twyad, you'll find all the different ways that you can subscribe. You want to automatically download it to your iPhone? Great. Your iPod? Sure. Your iPad? Yes. Your Android device? Your Zune? Your Zombie Zune? These are all possible with just a flick of the menu and a selection. Now, the, the cool thing about that is you can actually get multiple versions of Twyad depending on where you're going to be listening or watching. If you want to listen to the audio in the car, that's definitely possible. If you want to sit down at your house in front of your big 60-inch screen and, well, listen to some Uber Geek goodness with a loved one, that's also possible. Uh, I suggest that you, you get a, a version that suits you well, but also make sure that you get it each week because, well, we do build off of each and every single episode of Uber Geek goodness. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. If you log into that site, you'll be able to tell me what you want to see in the future, and you'll be able to comment on previous episodes. Not only that, you'll be able to find out what the Digital Jesuit is doing in the real world. Finally, did you know that we do the show live? That's right. Every Monday at noon Pacific, we actually get together, and uh, we do this in the real world. If you join us, you'll also be able to jump into the chat room at irc.twit.tv and we'll talk to some of the most brilliant geeks, some of the, the, the funniest trolls, and, and just enjoy the temporary community that is Twit. Finally, I want to thank all the people who have made this possible, our producer, Jason, uh, Karsten, our, our super TD, Jason, everyone here at the Brick House. I'm Father Robert Balasare. This is Twyat, and remember, if you want to know what's going on in the Enterprise, just keep twice.